you to turn in your Bibles to Luke 20. How many of you have ever been through a time, and maybe you're in a time like this, where it seems like you've tried everything you know to do, you've tried this option or that option, or you've tried this possibility or that possibility, and nothing seems to work out, and the more that you do, the more it seems not to work, and you get to a place where you give up. I believe that's exactly the place that God wants us to be. A place where we get to the end of ourself and we come to that place where we say, Lord, unless you do something, nothing's going to happen. Unless you move, nothing is going to change. Unless you intervene in some way, shape, or form, I don't know what we're going to do, but God, we trust in you. And I believe this is exactly where God wants us to come to. And I want to start with a scripture this morning, Luke 20, verse 18. It says, whoever falls on that stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him into powder. Interesting passage. Father, I pray that you give us ears to hear and that you speak to our hearts. I ask, Father, that our hearts would contain good soil. Lord, that the root of your word, would, with your seed of your word would take root in us and grow in us and become strong. As we apply it to our lives, Lord, the result would be fruitfulness and faithfulness on our part. But Lord, that you would be blessed and that you would be glorified in us and through us. We give you praise and thanksgiving this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I was going to preach another sermon. I have a really good sermon that I'm not going to give today. And on Saturday morning, it seemed like everything changed. And, it, and, and in essence, the Lord said, get real. Get real because, you know, I don't know about you. I don't like going through the motions. I don't like doing religious rituals. I don't like doing things just to do them because we've always done them this way. If what we're doing isn't working, let's throw it out and start over. I don't mind that. In fact, I welcome that. But in order to do that, we have to have the mind of Christ. It's like we have to come to that place of, of being broken before the Lord, of saying, God, I give up. All that I'm trying to do isn't working. And you will come to that place, and perhaps multiple times in your life, if you are seriously following God, if you seriously are seeking Him, He will take you seriously, and He will say, okay, you're going to follow after me, but understand that it's not going to work out the way that you want it to or the way that you think it should. Just because you want to start a business doesn't mean I want you to start a business. Just because you want to have a family doesn't mean I want you to have a family. Just because you want to go somewhere doesn't mean I want you to go somewhere. So if you're going to pursue me, understand that you're going to do it my way. And there's a breaking that has to happen in our lives if we're to truly find ourselves in the purposes of God. For some of us here this morning, there are sin issues, there are rebellion issues, there are things in our lives that God has been putting his finger on, and because we begin to resist, we find ourselves on the outside looking in. And God would say to you this morning, if you're in that kind of a situation or condition, give up. The scripture says that it, whoever falls on that stone, the stone that's being talked about here is Christ. Whoever falls on Christ, understand, it doesn't say we'll be fixed. It says we'll be broken. Whoever falls on Christ, that they will be broken. Their self-will will be broken. Their self-reliance will be broken. Their making it happen will be broken. Whoever falls on Christ, because when we fall on him, the power of sin over us is broken. The power of self over us is broken. The power of our independent nature 
is broken. When we fall on Christ and acknowledge and say, Jesus, I don't know what to do anymore. The arrogance of having it all figured out, having everything under, uh, you know, in, in exactly the way we want it gets all messed up because we're brought into a dependence and a trust in Christ. And I'm here to tell you this morning that you will go through this. I've heard people say, well, you know what? I just want to learn from those who've gone before so I don't make those same mistakes, so I don't have to go through those same things. There's a measure of wisdom in that. But there's also an aspect that we kind of tend to try to avoid the discipline of God in our lives to bring us into that place where we're purified before him and fully engaged in what he would have us to be about. And he utilizes circumstances, situations, other people to bring that about. Because it says, on whomever Christ falls, they will be scattered like dust. If we wait until Christ begins to take action, the hardness of our self-will will be crushed. The hardness of our independence will be shattered. The hardness of unrepentant sin will be consumed. And these people will find themselves blown away like powder. And one school of thought on this passage says that it's about receiving Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, that those who fall on him will receive salvation, but those who resist and who rebel and who resist the, the power of God, the, 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 they will be crushed. And I believe that that is a correct interpretation. But Jesus here is talking to the Pharisees. Pharisee literally means set apart. The Pharisees saw themselves as the keeper of the true ways of God. In other words, they felt they had revelation that other people didn't share. They felt that they were a cut above everybody else. They felt like they had the, the, the very word of God and knew what to do, knew what to say, and everybody else needed to listen to them. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever had that situation, that's, that thought? You know, if everybody else would just listen to me and do what I tell them to do, the world would be a better place. Anybody ever thought that? If these people over here would just do what I tell them to do about this particular situation, if these people here would just tell me, we would just, would just pick up and, and, and engage with this person, then, then it would be a better place. If everybody would just do what I want them to do, wow. And yet, how many times does that work? It doesn't. Out of the people that Jesus taught and he interacted with, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the ones that were set apart were the ones that he was most critical of. And he was critical of their actions. He was also critical of their hearts because their outward actions looked good, but their inner heart was defiled. He called them, he called them a brood of vipers. He called them a whitewashed tomb. Why did he do that? Because he knew that what was being projected on the outside did not reflect the reality of their inside. And so let me ask you another question this morning. Does the reality of who you are inside, ac is it accurately being projected into your life, into your activities, into the things that you're about? We all operate with images. We all like people to think well of us. And yet at the same time, the reality of our heart is what God wants to touch. And he wants us to be whole. Whole meaning that the outside and the inside are the same. How many of us are that way? Our outer actions look good, but in reality, we're hurting. In reality, our motives, our attitudes are not good. Our responses to people's offenses, maybe not to their face, but to your spouse. Have you ever had a conversation with no one when you're driving in your car down the road? And you tell that person exactly what they need to think and exactly how they need to behave and exactly just how they should do something different. And if they would just do it and you find yourself getting irritated and agitated and upset and you come up alongside of another car and they look over and they look at you and you look at them and you realize they just caught you blessing out that other person. See, what's in the heart is coming out 
and it comes out when you're by yourself. What comes out of you when no one is around to hear and no one is around to listen and you say, you know, if I could just say something to that person and it wouldn't have any consequences, this is exactly, I tell them exactly what I think, exactly how I feel. Your outer actions are different, but the inner motives, the inner responses to people, our responses to their imperfections, our responses to their offenses, our hidden actions, that's what determines who we are. At the time, as time progresses, there will be a time. The Bible calls it a harvest. The Bible calls it the end times. The Bible calls it a time. And we, you and I don't know when exactly that's going to come for us because we have a lifetime. Some of us may leave here today and, 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 and die tonight. And so our end is, is short. Some of us, I, you know, I keep telling people I'm going to live to be 92. You all got a long ways to, to walk with me, okay? But, Lord bless you. But it's like... Um, it's like you don't know how long whoever falls on that stone, Christ, will be broken. But who, on whomever it falls, those will be scattered like dust. Why? Because only the broken are going to be able to survive the coming glory of God. Only those that are broken before God only those that are humbled before others. Only those that understand that they really know very little. And God knows a whole lot. And we come to the end of ourselves. It's not about us offering God something. Do you realize God doesn't need you? God doesn't need your intellect. He doesn't need your gifting. He doesn't need anything about you. He doesn't need it, but he chooses you. Do you see the difference? If you and I take this attitude of saying, well, you know what, I have to do this because of who I am and what I carry and, and what I can bring to the table, we've missed it. If we come humbled and say, how can I help? How can I serve? That's the heart of Jesus. Only the broken can survive the coming glory of God. And God is about bringing us to a place of brokenness. He's about bringing us to a place where self-reliance becomes God-reliance. A place where forgiveness of others is quick. Instead of harboring unforgiveness, we come to a place of forgiveness and we extend that to other people. A place where circumstances do not have to dictate our attitudes. So, okay, life happens. Negative things may come about. How do you handle that? How do you approach the people that are around you? Something bad happens. Do you lash out at them, snap at them? Do you, do you, do you, do you how, what do you display? All that is revelation of what's inside. Some of us are very task-oriented, and we say, you know what? This is what I need to get done today. And then something happens that hinders you from your, achieving your goal. Anybody else get frustrated with that? Hallelujah, me too. And somebody comes and, and has a need, or somebody comes and does something stupid, or somebody comes and, and they just don't get it, and all of a sudden, you find yourself in a dilemma. Am I going to minister to that person, and I don't mean bless them out, I mean really accurately minister to that person and to their need, and it may take some time, or am I going to keep on with what I said I wanted to get done today. Which is more important to you, the people in your life or the tasks that you feel like you need to accomplish? Let me share with you, the only thing that you're going to take with heaven with you is the people that you bring along. Your tasks will burn up at some point. Do you realize that? All the things that you seem to think you want to build or you want to put into place or whatever, you know, they pale in comparison with the importance that Jesus places on the people that he brings us to minister to. Ministry is about people. And yet how many times do we put people aside so that we can embrace something that we think 
we need to do. See, our circumstances do not have to dictate our actions or our attitudes because he uses our failures. When you and I come to the end of ourselves and we mess up at something and we have to give up, he utilizes those failures to say, you know what? With me, you can do all things because I strengthen you. With yourself, you're on your own. But how many times do our prayers really become, God, bless what I want to do, and not, God, I want to be involved in what you're blessing? How many times do we say, well, God, I don't see anybody else doing that, so therefore I can't step out and do something unique or pioneer something because I don't have a model. And God is saying, I want to be your model. I want to create that through you. He uses our struggle with sin to reveal our humanness. He uses those struggles with sin to, to reveal our weaknesses. So that we cry out to God and say, God, there, if it wasn't for you, there am I. God, I need you because I can't conquer this myself. He uses the collapse of our plans. So that he reveals his purposes in us. He uses and I love this one, abrasive people to test our grace. You know, we say, God, teach me to be loving. And so next week you find yourself in the company of an abrasive person that was just hired at your workplace. And they irritate you. Oh, they irritate you. It's like, God, what did I do? What did I do to deserve this? And God says, you prayed for it. He's just answering your prayer. He uses imperfect people to test our patience. All to bring us to a place of dependence and trust in him. A place of faith. A place of obedience. A place of brokenness. Turn to Matthew 13. Jesus told a story. Starting in verse 24, another parable he put forth to them, his disciples saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who scattered good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. And so the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus here is telling the story of a man who planted a field. God is the planter. And Jesus said that this, this farmer sowed good seed. He sowed wheat into the field. But the enemy came, his enemy, the farmer's enemy came and sowed bad seed behind the wheat. Tares. It says both seed grew together. Both came up. Both sprouted. Both were in the field both experienced the same storms. They experienced the same rain. They experienced the same drought. They experienced the same times when things were dry, when things were too wet. They also experienced the same blight where, where insects would come against it. The, the, the wheat and the tares from this, the, both experienced the same thing. But the difference is that what the wheat produced a harvest and is valuable while the tares are barren and produce nothing. Now, interesting because the seed that is planted here sprouts up. The farmer really, I mean, it's very hard to tell the difference. And the owner's servants come and tell the farmer that he has two kinds of plants in the same field. They've discerned that there are wheat and there are tares, and the servants want to try and sort out one from the other. And the farmer says, no, let them grow together. It's hard to tell one from the other, and so if you start trying to differentiate between the wheat and the tear, you're going to probably pull up some of the wheat. So just let them grow together. 
Because at the end time, at the harvest, I'll know the difference. How will we know the difference? When the wheat gets into its full ripened state, its head begins to bend over because it carries the seed of its own multiplication. But a tear doesn't do that and it stays upright. And so at the harvest, it becomes very obvious who's submitted and who's humbled. Who's stiff-necked and who's bowed? Who has listened to the purposes of God and bowed themselves to them? And who has said, God, I'm going to do it my way. If you want me, that's fine. But God, this is the way it's going to be. And we become rebellious towards the things of God. The farmer says, well, no by the ones that bow. And so let me ask you a question this morning. Are you becoming a wheat? Or are you becoming a tear? Because I believe we have both seeds planted in us. I believe there's those aspects of our lives that God has put his seed in and it's good seed and it begins to sprout up. But there's also things that the enemy has planted in our lives that mean for us and our destruction. Are you yielding to the promptings of God? Or are you resisting the working of God in your life? If you're sitting here this morning saying, you know, this person, I wish they were here today to hear this. Let me refocus because God is speaking to you. The people that are here today are here. I have a sense that the jury, so to speak, may still be out for some of us. Because both kinds of people are planted in the kingdom. Both kinds of people experience struggles, experience failures, experience conflicts. Both kinds of people experience offenses from others. Both kinds of people, if you will, have a God-given purpose. But the kind of person you become is determined by how you respond to the circumstances and the people that God places before you. A person who is becoming a wheat, when, when they're offended, the wheat humbly forgives, even when they don't deserve it. They do it quickly. They don't mull on it for a week or a year or five years. They release it. When faced with a conflict or failure, the wheat does not blame others. How many of us, something messes up in our lives, and instead of taking responsibility for what happens, we begin to look around and say, who can I blame? Why did this happen? Whose fault is it? Does it really matter? It doesn't, because it's done. You can't go back. How many times, instead of just simply saying, you know what, this is the way it is, I take responsibility for it and move on. We allow strife to, to come in and we say, well, who's to blame? Whose fault is it? Why isn't this done? Why did that happen? And we need to pin this down so that we can go tell that. Well, to go do what to that person? What do you really want to do? The wheat does not judge others. It prays and intercedes for them. Do you realize that you are not necessarily God's gift to that other person to tell them what is wrong and right with their life? That when you see something that is not what God would have and desire, that your first call is to pray for them and intercede for them in love as opposed to give them a piece of your mind? Because giving someone a piece of your mind may make you feel better, but it doesn't make them feel better. But when you pray for that person and you intercede for that person, actually some good and positive change may take place. What do you respond to? When someone comes to you and criticizes you, how do you respond? 
When someone comes in anger towards you, how do you respond? When someone comes at you with all your faults and begins to point them out to you, how do you respond to that? Most of us, if any of us, don't respond well. We don't like that. We don't appreciate that. It makes us defensive. It makes us be quiet. We isolate ourselves and we say, I don't want anything to do with that person any longer. So why would you be that person that goes to another people and tell them what's wrong with them? Why not better just simply impart the presence of God into their life and say, Lord, bless them. Lord, you see what's going on, Lord. I pray for an opposite spirit to come and minister into their lives. I pray, Lord, that where there is hatred, there would be love. Where there is, is chaos, that there would be peace. And you begin to pray the answer rather than pray the negative. I fully believe our intercession could be 10 times more effective if we, instead of criticizing what this nation is or isn't doing, that we would pray the blessing and pray what God would have in this nation. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's far easier for us to highlight the negative than to pray for the positive. And yet that's exactly what God is calling us to do, not only in individuals, but as we intercede. The wheat is engaged in reaching out and ministering to others, even when they don't respond like you wish they would. Because how many of us have had that experience of we invest in a person's life, we may invest our resources, we invest our time, we, we speak with them, we minister to them, we pray for them, we take them places, all to have it just simply turned and it's like they leave. Or they do exactly what we ask them not to do. And we have this phrase, you know, we say, well, you know what? You're on your own. I'm going to wash my hands of you. You know, I thank God that he didn't wash his hands of me. That Jesus doesn't say, well, you get two shots at this and that's it. Because I've needed more than two shots. And he didn't say, you've got to get it right by the third time. I don't know if I still get it right. Because God's mercy and his grace is sufficient for me and for you. And yet it's also sufficient for that person that irritates you because you've helped them and they seem to turn your back on them. What you are doing is you're simply sowing seeds into that person's life. And the Bible tells us that the word of God will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which he purposes. Do you realize that you may not get the answer this year, but it may be next year? And it may be five years from now, but God's purpose will be worked out. The wheat is growing in Christ's likeness yielding to his prompting, obeying his purpose. See, we are flexible in God's hands because they're humbled. They're broken. They've chosen to throw themselves on Christ and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, not my attitude, but yours be in me. Not my motives, Lord, but yours be upon me. Let me have your mind, Lord. I throw myself on you. And we break ourselves over the stone of Christ. We're flexible in God's hands. We're responsive to his spirit. The tares respond differently. Tares cannot deal with the imperfection in other people because they see other people and they become critical. And their first element is to criticize what they perceive as something that isn't right. And rather than looking at themselves and dealing with that, they look at the other person. And they criticize and they judge and they become angry and they become bitter at life. Because all of a sudden, life isn't good. And why isn't life better? And God, why didn't you do something about that situation? It's because God wanted to teach you through it. Tares are easily offended. Somebody does something. I remember we had this one guy, and, and, uh, and this was when I was a teenager and uh, late teens, and I went to this college, and the college was on a hill. And the, the, basically the college property ended at the top of the hill, and on just the other side of that, that line, there was this guy's house. And this guy, um, he, he had a really nice yard. 
Now, my best friend lived just on the other side, bordered that property. And me and him, we hung out a lot together. And every now and then, it was just much more convenient to walk across the guy's yard. And if he was there, every time we would start walking across his yard, it was like he just sat at his front room and looked for people to come across his yard so he could come storming out of his front door and tell us to get off of his yard. I mean, under no certain terms. I mean, he was scary. So we being who we were, it was kind of fun to see if we could get the guy going. Because we knew he was watching, and he had to be, he always was there. And so we would just kind of look around and, you know, and then kind of start walking across it just, just to get on him, you know. That's what you do. This guy was easily, easily offended. Should we have been walking across his yard? No. But does that mean he has to be ugly and nasty about it? Is his yard really worth destroying a relationship with people? Tears blame others for their circumstances. If you had just seen things my way, I wouldn't have the problems that I have. If you had just done what I wanted you to do, then I could just do what I want to do. If you had just talked different, if you had just been different, and all of a sudden now we blame someone else for our situation or our circumstances, instead of taking responsibility for ourselves, it's got to be someone else's fault because we've got to blame someone. You're well on your way to becoming a tear. Stiff, unbent. God doesn't have those kind of attitudes. He's not looking up there, sitting from heaven, looking for someone to blame. He's looking for someone to save. He's looking for someone to, to minister to. He's looking for someone that will be responsive to his love. Tears do not forgive or take responsibility because they're unbroken. They're unbending. They are stiff. They are unyielding. Now, Jesus said you will not know one from the other until the harvest because many of us put on a really good face, but it's the inside that Jesus looks at. Now, I believe there's still time for each of us. The wheat is broken before God and before others, yielded and humble. The tear is unbroken, arrogant, unyielding both towards God and towards those around him. And so I ask you again this morning, which, which are you becoming? Which are you becoming? Because if we allow ourselves to fall on Christ, if we allow him to break us, if we allow him to do in us, to soften us and humble us and make us that flexible person that is putty in his hands that he can mold and he can shape into his image and into his likeness. We realize how great he is and how small we are in comparison. We have that opportunity. And I believe that's what God's desire is. Are you feeling broken this morning? Are you in a circumstance that is bringing you to the end of yourself? It may be a financial circumstance. It may be a relational circumstance. It may just be that you're so irritated with yourself that you don't know what to do anymore. And the pressure is getting harder and harder and harder to bear. And you feel like something is going to break. That's exactly where God wants you because he wants to break you. So my invitation this morning is give up. Give up. Let God do what he wants to do. Humble yourself. Fall on Christ and say, okay, Lord, I cry uncle. I'm going to tap out. I give up. 
Are you ready to give up this morning? Or are you going to continue to be stiff and unyielding and unbending in the face of his love and his grace and his power? Let's stand together. I want the worship team to come. If the Lord has spoken to you this morning, I'm going to ask that you humble yourself and that you respond to him. If you know that he's put his finger on something, I'm going to ask that you repent of that which you know he's put his finger on. That you bring this to the Lord and that you do so at the altar this morning. Sometimes we say, well, you know what? I can just respond to God in my seat, and you can. But if God is prompting you, if he's calling you, he wants you to respond because there's an act of submission, and there's this act of humility of acknowledging Jesus' work in your life before others. Now, this is a safe place to do this because all of us, or at least many of us, have been to the altar here. We know we are human. We all have issues. We all have things that God is doing in our lives. No one will look down on you and think less of you. As we worship, I invite you to respond. Maybe you realize this morning that you...